What up? Um, if you've got a Bible with you, um, or a phone or anything, if you want to turn to John chapter 6, um, and we're going to be continuing looking at that. Uh, so we're going to be looking at John chapter 6, verses 16 to 24, and if you've been paying attention, you'll realise that we've just jumped a section. Um, we've had to reschedule a few things, um, and we'll be coming back to that. That's the feeding of the 5,000 in a couple of weeks, uh, so look forward to that. Um, but this evening, we're going to be reading or looking at verses 16 to 24. Uh, so let's read that. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I. Don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realised that only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples but had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realised that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please help us to learn from your word. Let your spirit be touching our hearts and and changing us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Two weeks ago, we had a completely unmitigated disaster in Alice Springs. Um, We had a bit of rain. And Alice Springs was brought to its knees. Um, You might have noticed uh, that the whole town got split in two, that for at least a couple of hours, no one could access each side, which is probably a good thing. Um, and I was getting live stream photo updates from my housemate Sean of the, the bloke that was trapped uh, in the middle of the, the water who got washed away in his car. Um, and it disrupted our entire lives. Um, I know some people get, didn't get to work, schools had the day off, um, and a lot of people had days off. Unfortunately, I didn't. Um, but it didn't just disrupt us on that day, it disrupted us for days after that. Um, it showed that nature really still has a lot of power over us. Um, Even a a couple of days afterwards, which is probably almost a week later, my sister Rachel took my car out to birthday waterhole, which I didn't know about, (laughs) and then I'm getting texts 24 hours later when I'm busy in court, and they're like, we just passed, like unknown numbers texting me saying, we've just passed your sister who's bogged, Um, send help please. (laughs) Um, Thankfully, she has good friends that actually go out and save her. Um, that did save her. But that was all because the waters had ridden ridden so high that she couldn't get to Birthday Waterhole. Um, And that's just on a small scale. On a big scale, nature can change not just a town like Alice Springs, it can change entire civilizations. It can affect crops, it can affect invading armies, it can change all sorts of things. And the reality is that as humans, we're very dependent on nature. Um, It affects all these things about our lives. But tonight, we're going to be looking at someone who has power over nature. We're going to be looking at how Jesus is both terrifying and comforting uh, in showing his power over nature. Uh, More powerful than the flowing Todd River um, and more terrifying than any near-death experience, but at the same time, more comforting than any little kid going to their parent when they're scared. So this is the scene. It's evening, and there's darkness all across the land. Uh, There's a bit of a literary link there, that when there's darkness, that's often when the disciples don't have Jesus around, when they're by themselves. And normally, at least in John's Gospel, there's often a lot of issues when he's around. They get in trouble. Um, Now, the disciples had gotten gotten to their boat, and then they start heading away to Capernaum. Um, So they've just been at this point where Jesus has fed 5,000 people. Um, And it's an interesting point in Jesus' life because he's faced with this temptation. Um, He's just won 5,000 people over um, and 
they, they say here and they say later on that they want to make Jesus their king. Um, they're seeing this guy that has this incredible power to suddenly produce free food. Um, they're looking for the, this Messiah and they want him to be their king. Um, they're probably thinking we, want, we need this military leader or this political leader who can defeat the Romans and, and restore, us to, um, re- restore the Jews to, to being in power in Israel. But Jesus doesn't take advantage of this sudden opportunity that he has. He has this opportunity to seize all this power, to get these 5,000 people and go around to towns and probably make it a, a whole lot more, a whole lot bigger. But instead, he goes off by himself. Um, and Mark's Gospel says he goes off to a mountainside and he prays. And the people do keep looking for him. We actually see at the end of that section that they, they keep chasing Jesus into Capernaum because um, they keep looking to make him their king which Jesus is resisting. So Jesus goes off by himself and he sends his disciples ahead to the city, to Capernaum, and says, I'll catch up with you later. Now, they're going across the Sea of Galilee, which is a bit of a wind funnel. Um, They've gone three to three and a half miles, um, which is uh, 4.8 to 5.6 kilometres. And the shore is out of sight. Now, they might be able to see some far-off mountains in the distance, but the reality is it's actually night time, so they can't see anything. So they're in the middle of the lake, and the wind's against them. Uh, and the, the Greek word for the wind is actually, well, it's a very strong wind, which can also mean storm. So it's billowing storm, waves are coming, um, and it's in this situation that they see something that they've never seen before. Um, it might be a familiar story for us, but actually living it and seeing it yourself I think fear, which the disciples show, is the natural response. Uh, And there's two kind of main ways that that fear is presented. Firstly, there's fear of the natural. So the disciples, are um, they they can see the wind, they can see the waves. There's fear of death. There's these natural elements that they're probably going to lead to them drowning. Um, They are experienced fishermen, so maybe they do have the tools to survive. Maybe they can handle it, um, but they are scared. So that's what's naturally scaring them. And then there's something supernatural that scares them, something unknown. Um, A storm is something they understand, but this ghost figure who comes walking towards them, that's something else. They don't know what to do with someone that walks on water. They've already seen Jesus feeding 5,000 people. They've seen him healing people. They've seen all these other miracles. But then they see this figure walking on water, and this completely dumbfounds them, terrifies them. And they have a confused and panicked response. They, we might like to think of them as you know, people living 2,000 years ago. They have, you know, maybe they'll believe anything they see. But the reality is they're panicking. They're terrified. This isn't in the realms of possibility of what they know. And what this is addressing is maybe something that's part of a culture that I wasn't necessarily raised in. And it's probably something that our um, Arundel brothers and sisters might be able to have a bit more insight into. Um, the anthropologists talk about three main paradigms which people position themselves socially. Um, so being from a Western society, we often think of things in terms of guilt and innocence. If someone's guilty or if they're innocent, that that's determines their social standing. Um, whereas from a Middle Eastern or Asian background, um, it's often thought of in terms of honour and shame. So whatever you do can bring honour to your family or it can bring shame to your family. Um, And what this is getting at is what's called the fear and power paradigm. Um, Now, all these are ideas that Jesus addresses quite clearly, as you would expect from someone who's transcended culture and transcended time. But specifically here, he's looking at the fear-power paradigm, which is uh, perhaps more dominant in um, animistic or African or Indigenous cultures, um, Australian Indigenous. But it's obviously in the you know, globalised world, it's not something that's mutually exclusive, nor has it always been mutually exclusive. Uh, we still live in fear today. We're in the middle of a pandemic where a lot of the, the messaging and discussion has been fear-based. There's fear of death, fear of vaccines, fear about government overreach. Um, and so fear isn't something that's just unique to the time then. But Jesus shows us and tells us three big reasons in this passage why we don't have to fear. He's answering and he's demonstrating something that's intrinsic in human nature to fear, and he's showing us why we don't have to fear. So first reason, 
And it's the most obvious. We don't have to fear because Jesus was walking on the water. We don't have to fear because this guy has demonstrated that he has power over nature. Now, some people might try and say he was walking on a sandbar, there was an optical illusion, he was using some sort of foot contraption to walk on it. But the the Greek preposition says he was physically on the water. He's five kilometres out from the shore. So the only explanation is that he was walking physically on the water. doesn't say he was skiing barefoot or running really fast. He's walking on it and showing his power over nature. So what that means is Jesus has power over the wind, the rain, the Nino Nino cycles, the flooding Todd River. Jesus is in control over all of that. So instead of living in this world where there's arbitrary rules, where there's chaos, even though it often feels like that's how things operate, we can know that there's a higher purpose to it, that someone's actually in control and that there's a reason behind it because Jesus has power over nature. The second reason we don't have to fear is because Jesus comes to the boat. In verse 19, they see him coming near the boat and that's when they get shocked. Someone's in the water approaching them. Jesus comes towards them. And it shouldn't be any less astounding today than it was back then that Jesus comes to us. It's a miracle. And there's the the obvious miracle of Jesus physically approaching the boat then, but then there's a metaphorical link there to how we are today, that Jesus walks over our fear, over our sin, over our shame, and comes to get us. So some of us might know what it's like to have a storm raging around us, to be feeling tossed by the wind, to be living in fear of the unknown. And Jesus here is teaching them something about himself and his care for people. So some of us might be rowing against this storm um, and getting nowhere. And it's probably, it's a common idea. It's what every worldview or every religion really teaches, aside from Jesus, saying that you're chucked in this, in this water with a paddle, with this r- wind in the rain, now do your best. Do your best and maybe it will be enough. Maybe you'll get that boat to shore. Maybe you'll get it to safety. Um, maybe you'll get to the end of the, your life and you're a good enough person. But the reality is, that's completely impossible. The wind's against you, you're lost, you're weak, you're drowning. And no matter how hard you try to row, you're not gonna get there unless you have a savior. So we need a savior. And that's when Jesus comes to us. Um, He's not just walking on the water, but he's coming to us. He's crossing our sin and our shame and our fear. He does the miracle, he reaches us. And that's unique to Jesus. It's not dependent on us, but it's dependent on him. He's the saviour. Now, the third reason we don't have to fear is because of what Jesus says to his disciples. In verse 20 there, he says, It is I, don't be afraid. Now, on the one hand, it's a very simple thing to say. Um, It sounds a bit like something that a parent might say to a child when the child's scared of the dark. Um, And it's incredibly comforting. Uh, it's, it's very simple. Um, Jesus doesn't come and give them some big TED talk about this is why fear is irrational um, and why, you know, give them a big dissertation on why they don't have to be fearful. No, he says, I'm with you. Um, exactly the same way a parent might speak to their child. Um, and it's that simple message that Jesus often gives to the most vulnerable and fearful people that he's there. And sometimes that very simple message is exactly what we have to hear in a difficult time. But there's also another level at what Jesus is speaking at. Um, He's saying something quite profound. Um, And we actually looked at this a few weeks ago when he was talking to the Samaritan woman. In the Greek, he's saying, ego ami, um, which is the exact Greek words used to translate from the Hebrew in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. Um, When Moses is talking to God in the burning bush and Moses says to God, "Um, what should I call you? And God says, call me I am, Yahweh. I am who I am. Um, And this comes after this whole stream of uh, 
Jesus demonstrating that he is that same God who led the Israelites out of Egypt that saved them from slavery. He's just fed the 5,000, like given them bread from heaven, the same as God giving them manna in the desert. He, in that event, he also divided them up into 12 different camps, the same as the 12 tribes of Israel. He's gone off to a mountain to hear from God, the same as Moses. And now he's just walked on water. So not only did Moses split the water and walk through it, Jesus has one-upped it and he's walked across the water. Um, and he's telling the disciples, um, kind of subtly, that not only is he there for them emotionally, but he is this God who has been there for the people of Israel for the last 2,000 years. And the point that Jesus is trying to get to his disciples isn't just trying to tell them to live a certain way or be better people. He's trying to tell them who he actually is. So when he comes and he says, this is me, don't be afraid, it's a lot more than just any parent you know, condoling or comforting their child. He's actually a le- he means a lot more because he is the I am, the same God who's been there for his people. So how does this change how we live? How does this change what we do? Well, first big point, we don't have to live in fear. Where there's fear, or where is there fear in your life that you have to be reminded that Jesus is there for you? Are there any fears in your life that you're letting control your thought processes? Is it fear of losing someone or something, or fear that something might happen, or fear of this pandemic? or new strains of the virus, or fear of spiritual oppression, whatever it is, we know that Jesus has power over it. And we can see that we don't need to keep rowing, that we don't need to keep slaving away in the middle of the night and facing these giant waves because Jesus walked on those waves. Jesus walked on them, came to us in our boat and saved us. Saved us from these insurmountable forces that we're against and in our powerlessness, he reaches out to us and saves us. So in our fear of death, in our fear of eternity, in all these natural forces that are coming and these supernatural forces, Jesus is there. And this isn't something that's far off and theoretical in the future. Uh, In this chapter, in verse 21, it says, uh, when they were willing to take him into the boat and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. Jesus immediately takes them to the safe shore Um, there's security immediately for people following Jesus. So ultimately, in that fear and power dynamic, there's no longer any need to live in fear of these forces of nature and these supernatural forces. But it doesn't mean that fear isn't a part of our human experience, but it means that fear can be directed to the appropriate location. Um, instead of fearing these forces that are out of control and that we don't understand, there is power that ultimately lies with the one who controls the wind and the waves and everything around it. And that's where appropriate fear lies. Uh, It's not a fear that terrifies us of Jesus. Um, There's a mystery to it. Um, The Bible often talks about the fear of the Lord and describes the fear of the Lord as being the beginning of wisdom. Um, But it's not this fear of wind and waves and the unnatural things or supernatural things. It's a fear of reverence. Uh, It's a bit like going to Ormiston Gorge or Kings Canyon and going to the edge of one of the cliffs and you you treat it with reverence. Um, You you respect it. You don't start doing gymnastics on the edge of the cliff um, because it deserves a respect and a wonder. And that's where appropriate fear goes towards God. So this is the God who showed himself to the disciples and still shows himself to us today. So we don't have to fear. Jesus has reached us. He, is, his, he has power over the natural and supernatural. He's saved us in the middle of the night, in the middle of a storm. He's our saviour uh, and he has the power over everything that we fear. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have power over nature, uh, that you've shown that power, that you've come to us um, in all our fear and our shame, and that you've saved us. 
And Lord, we, we ask that you would um, help us to, to follow you appropriately, um, that we won't be um, tossed and turned by fearful things in our lives, but we'll know that, that you're in control. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.